And welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Corey O'Daniel, co-founder and CEO of MassDriver. I like this description too, a company that helps to improve the developer experience of cloud operations. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But we're talking today on well, welcome, Corey. I should say that first. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> We're talking today about bridging the cloud infrastructure talent gap with software. And maybe I always like to start, Corey, like more about who are you? What does your company actually do to kind of set the ground? Yeah. Um, so I'm a software engineer. I've been in cloud operations since AWS launched EC2 uh, back in like 2000 six or so. Um, previous to that, I was a HIPAA security analyst, worked in healthcare, um, healthcare information systems. And it's been in the space for a long time. And so, you know, I've worked for startups, I've worked for big organizations. Um, I've worked in professional services with Google doing massive cloud migrations. And what I've consistently seen over you know the past 15, 20 years is this gap in, in operational knowledge, especially as we've moved to the cloud. Like the cloud is just constantly kept at this pace and a lot of engineers haven't kept up with it. And so what you're starting to see is a very small number of the percent of engineers that we have on this planet that have experience managing the cloud at scale and in production. And that number is getting smaller every year. So uh, what MassDriver does is we make it easier to manage cloud infrastructure. We make it easier to kind of scale your operations teams. So the idea is your operations teams use the tools that they're familiar with and they kind of package up their expertise in these things we call bundles. And then your developers, instead of them having to go and learn all the ins and outs of a cloud service, they can effectively just draw infrastructure. And as they're drawing it, it's building the infrastructure based on your company's policies, uh, compliance, security requirements, et cetera. So operations engineers, like if you got two or three or five or 10, it might feel like you have 20, 30, 50 or 100. And you're not constantly slowed down by engineers tapping the shoulders of ops people saying, hey, I need you to make this change in the cloud for me, or I need you to build a Terraform module for me, or like, what should I configure this subnet with? Like, you just kind of draw and go. It's interesting uh, about, so it's been about a, a decade, really, since the hard push towards the cloud. I know it's been around for a long time. So, software as a service, that term came right around 2000, I think. Uh, I mean, the first SaaS company I worked for was in 2001 um, th that eventually was based down in, uh, or were they? We started, we're on the, the San Francisco Peninsula, but uh, ended up down in Redwood City uh, before I left. Um, but, you know, the, so, uh, so I had been trying to talk to customers back in 2001 to convince them to move their data and trust the cloud. And there it was a dedicated, it was a private cloud system and it was very secure. Um, but again, it took a long time. But here 10 years ago um, it is really like 2012 to 2015, where organizations really started looking at moving their systems into production. And one of the loudest voices out there were the IT pros that worked in the on-prem world that saw like my job's going away. And you know, all the conversations, all the content that's out there, you can go and search Google, find these articles written saying like, hey, there's opportunity for people in this space. So what's kind of happened to that? We had all these people that were natural fit to move into these roles. Has that just not happened or you know, what, what's changed? Yeah, so I think a couple of interesting things have happened. Um, those people had to go through a career change, right? I mean, that's, that's really what they went through. Like you have people in data centers, right? You have two types of roles, two, maybe three types of people that I feel like fall into this operations and DevOps space. It's either people that worked in data centers and, you know, their data centers are moving to the cloud and now they're learning cloud, right? So they had these physical machines that they managed, routers, switches, cabling, uh, AC, <laughs> humidity, like these physical things they managed and then the operating systems. And now there are these virtual things they deal with in the cloud, right? So now their job went from, 
I know how to administer Linux systems and switches to, I need to know how to write software to manipulate APIs. And some of those people didn't have software development experience. Like they might have scripting experience, but they didn't have experience writing like, you know, formal languages or whatnot. So they had to literally learn new stuff to maintain their job, right? Uh, and I think the other people that kind of are coming into this space based off of what I see on Reddit slash DevOps is, IT people, right? So like, you know, in, in some countries, like IT and software developments grouped into like the same, like it's all IT, but in the US, we tend to say like people that manage like workstations in the office are IT and then there's software, right? Like it's two separate worlds. And you're seeing a lot of IT people come into managing cloud as different, you know, services are normally like in your offices are moving to the cloud, right? Just, you know, mm -hmm. Office 365, et cetera. Um, and so you have these two groups that had to change their skill set to maintain what a lot of people consider like the same job, right? And so that's slow. At the same time, what's happening with the world is everything is moving online. Everybody's a software company now, right? Like you look at Nordstrom, Nordstrom's GitHub is amazing. They're doing tons of cool stuff with Kubernetes. They're a clothing company, right? But they're a software company. Like everyone is a software company now. We need more software developers. We make them in like eight to 12 weeks out of boot camps. And so like the shift is people are expecting things in the cloud. Users are expecting things faster. They're expecting them to have more uptime. Developers, companies are going and hiring developers from boot camps, which they're printing out quickly. There's nothing like a boot camp for operations people, right? And learning production, learning the cloud is running something in the cloud. It's not sitting down on your machine and like learning how to code and build something cool. Like operations is knowing how to troubleshoot a production system. I got a million users actively using this thing and like 20% of them are experiencing a degradation. Like how can I get to the root cause of that right now? So those users don't go to somebody else and buy, right? Like, right. and that you don't learn that in school. Like you don't learn that in the boot camp. You learn it by being in production. So like the, the education path of operations is much more difficult than that of software engineers. And just the demand for software engineers has accelerated. So you see like, you know, this number of, we say like, you should have one operations person per like 10 developers or something like that. Like the reality is like looking at some of the surveys, it's less than 6% of the global developer population has cloud experience. Right. But That's, we're all it, running there. It, it's, it's fascinating about that. I remember speaking to, in fact, uh, um, I was telling you, so I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay area and, um, going and speaking to one time uh, because my attorney uh, taught at uh, UC Berkeley in the MBA program. And I got a, a speaking opportunity to go and talk to mostly engineering students, um, computer science uh, students there at Berkeley uh, and answering that question of like, well, what other, what other job opportunities out there besides just these core functions? And I talked about the operation side of that. And then, you know, I had co-authored a couple books on software configuration management and had that background in project management. I said, there is, uh, says we, we can't find enough people that help run the systems and tools to support those engineering teams. Yeah. I don't see like that, that need has not gone away. It's exactly what you said. I mean, that's yeah. another, that's a specific role within these larger organizations, um, which I mean, a lot of those roles, I think even organizations think, well, we can move somebody from engineering over into that role, but it's a distinctive, separate function. And I would say talent and, you know, people that are passionate about that space. It, it is. And so when I said earlier, there's like two, maybe three, like that is the third. And that's actually where I came from. Like I was doing software development and it was just like, okay, well, like I knew a little bit about working in data centers. And so like our first... My first real like cloud experience, I worked for this digital signage company. I was a software developer on one of their ad products and they were in a data center and Amazon, it was, it was one of these conversations my boss had with me where I'm just like nodding, but I'm like, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. <laughs> and uh, this is 2006, 2007. And he walks in and he's like, hey, you've worked in a data center before. Like we had a distinct operations team. We had a distinct software development team. Mm -hmm. And I was like the only person in software that had worked in a data center. And he's like, you worked in a data center before, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay. He's like, Amazon launched, Amazon to me is a, a book company, right? Yeah. <laughs> At this point yep. in time, They're like they launched these like cloud computer VM things. Like we're going to, like our lease is expiring. Like we're going to migrate everything to this. And like, you're going to take lead on it. And I'm just like, 
like 23. Like, I'm yeah. like, I have no, yeah. I, no idea what you just said. A book, like the book company sells cloud computers. Like none of this stuff makes sense. But like, I just kind of like fell into it. And, and the DevOps movement felt very good to me because like I had the software experience, I had operations experience, but there are people that kind of come from the software world and, and, and go into, into the operations world and they have a lot to learn when they get there. Again, like it's like they can automate things faster, but they still may not have this experience of like troubleshooting things in production. And, and that's where I think that big gap lies is like that experience of running things in production is a very small group of people and it's hard to learn that without seeing it or apprenticing right like being alongside somebody who's troubleshooted one of these systems before reading their reports from an outage right yeah so what kind of patterns do you see uh, i mean i'm very interested in and in, in some of the data that's so many companies that I, i'm interested in, not as much as what they do but the data around what they do i'd love to look at from an you know analyst perspective at like what are the trends that you see with your customers of where these gaps are like what mistakes do you see organizations continuing to make in filling you know upskilling their people or filling these roles yeah i mean i think it depends on like the stage of of the company but it's really funny like i have a, i have an article that i wrote that some people appreciate and some people do not uh called devops is BS. I'm not sure if I can say the word on here, but uh, <laughs> DevOps is BS, right? And yeah. the funny thing is like when you read it, I have a very particular type of personality. I have a very unique way of speaking. Um, it's it's very, uh, it's a it's a colorful article, let's say that. But the funny thing is I believe in DevOps, right? So it's like, oh my gosh, like people are like, oh, this guy doesn't know what it is. It's like, no, I, I believe in it. But I also think it's like, a, it's a bit of BS at the same time. Um, and, and the reason why is I feel like where we are today is exactly where we were in like 2007 before like the the, the phrase was coined like we yeah. we've we've changed a lot of words we've said we're going to do a lot of things but and there's companies that are succeeding there's companies that are doing it well but for most companies it's it's bs like they just can't even get there and i think like when you look at bigger organizations where they're struggling with this is it's consistently management and i think on the on the operations team it's not marketing well so, and how those things come, come together is like management, they don't really get what ops does a lot of times. Like, I mean, like, it's funny, I worked for a startup and one time the CEO was like, I don't get what you do here. And I was like, it was a video chatting site in 2009. So like, imagine how hard that is. Imagine yeah. Zoom built in 2009 technology. And I was like, you know how we can do like 5,000 video streams at the same time? That's me doing my job. Like, you'll notice when I'm not doing my job, when the entire thing is on fire, like that's, that, that's me, that's me over there. Right. And like, so management, a lot of times has a hard time seeing what we do. Product managers have a hard time seeing what we do. And then we don't do a good job of marketing what we do. Right. And so what, what happens there is where do we put this budget? We've got, we got millions of dollars this year for engineering. Do we put it on this team that's building features that make us money? And how much of it do we give to these people that are supporting this team that's building the features that make us money? Right. And so what you see is our budgets are tiny, <laughs> tiny in comparison to the software teams, like uh, pound per pound uh, for staffing. Now, what also happens is a lot of times they'll just attribute the cloud cost to the DevOps team. It's like, well, they have a lot of money because they're spending the cloud stuff. It's like, well, that's actually, that's their software that's running, right? And so I think that that is one of the bigger things in bigger organizations is like, we, we don't do a good job as operations folk of like, making it clear what we do, how how hard it is, the budget that we need. And I don't think a lot of times the managers, particularly in companies where you see DevOps failing, are advocating for their staff and understand the impact that those operations engineers have on their developers. I think a lot of times you hear this joke in recruiting, like I'm looking for a 10x developer. There is no 10x developer, but operations done well has the potential to 10x your developers. Yeah. And a lot of teams don't get that opportunity. So I think that's the biggest problem in bigger organizations. Earlier startups like have this, um, I'm losing the word, but they have these like competing interests, right? So like as a startup, like your goal is to get to an MVP where somebody's buying, you're making money, the business is going, right? And so a lot of times you're fine cutting corners and there's some corners that you can cut and it's not that big of a deal. There's other corners that you cut that are just gonna have a much bigger cost down the line to, right. to do anything about it. And that's operations, right? And so a lot of times as a startup, you're like, okay, I've got the budget for three engineers. Do I go hire an ops person? No, that's hard to do. That ops person is not going to have 40 hours a week of work, right? And so they they don't. 
And so then they kind of cut corners in the cloud, they cut corners in like how they're doing their security posture, operations posture, DevOps posture. And then when they hit series A and they, they're dealing with compliance, they're dealing with security requirements, SOC 2, type 2. Now all of a sudden they have this huge problem that they have to address. They have this massive amount of technical debt and they hire their first ops person. And it's always funny as the first ops person, you're like, I'm the first ops person, this job's gonna suck. And so what you see is they struggle to attract that talent. So now they've got a big problem. <laughs> They're struggling to attract people to solve that problem because I can go make hundreds of thousands of dollars at Google solving interesting problems, or I can make a startup amount of salary solving a lot of technical debt and having a lot of people probably be frustrated with me because I can't move fast enough alone, right? Yeah. Um, so, so some think, people like that environment too. Like I've often been a, I've been a cleanup guy. I mean, I come from the project <laughs> management world and uh, most of my career was clean up. I mean, even, yeah. even the time I spent at Microsoft, I was, you know, had peer managers moved under me so I could clean things up and it's structured around operations. But one, one way around that, I mean, I remember one company that was, and, and maybe there's a difference too, that the CEO had been the COO of other companies came from that background. So understood that side of it, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, here it is it, 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 a startup they looked within their engineer engineering organization and found people that had indicated interest in moving in that other direction. So came out of engineering. That's how they bridge that gap. Yeah. Most organizations say don't do that. Again, they keep it separate or they say, we don't, we don't yet have the budget. We're not at the stage to hire that person to dedicate around that spot. But if you are and this is a cultural to management, a leadership thing. If you're talking to your people and looking what they're actually doing and what they're passionate about, you probably do have people that have some of those skills that can be developed that can move over into that role, at least do some of it part-time as part of their part of their role. Yeah. Yeah. And you see people do that. And that's and that's kind of like how I, I got into the space. I think it's a great way to to get there. But like what generally happens is, you know you you don't know you don't know right and so it's like you're kind of learning as you go that person starts to take on some of that responsibility and sometimes that works out very well what you see for a lot of startups is it it just it doesn't those people get burned out or they they struggle to attract that that second hire right and that, that's kind of like where we come in is like we see a lot of these companies where they're like we're we raise a seed round we raise a series a like we just have a nightmare and we've never figured out how to deal with it help <laughs> right and it's a great place for us um, but like, there's still a lot of companies that end up there. And I think like, it's one of those things that sucks. Cause like, I think infrastructure management and operations is exciting. I mean, I like building features. I like building things that users see and click on, but like dealing with the volume and the problems and just like the messiness of production, like that's where some of the most interesting problem solving happens. But I think for a lot of engineers that aren't interested in that side of the world, like they don't they don't, it's not that they're not interested in it. Engineers love problem solving. It's just like they, they've they solved problems so differently. They're solving these problems from like the product manager of like, how do we get more people to convert, right? It's like a very different style of problem they're solving. And I think that it can feel very frustrating for them the first time that they're dealing with some of these like outage problems. Like I built this great thing and now it's failing, right? Like it can feel like a failure versus like a learning opportunity. I think like that's when you see really good operations teams, that's what they look at failures as. It's like, how do we do a post-mortem and learn from this to make more resilient systems, better uptime? And like failures happen. Software is hard. You can't trust the network. It's always DNS. Like there's, right? right? Like the yeah. things fall right. apart and like you just have to live with it. And I think like when you're an engineer who's been engineering, haven't had to deal with like the operations side, and you're at an early stage company and now you are the one that like has kind of been sacrificed <laughs> to like yeah. dealing with it. Like that can be very shocking to, you know, their culture uh, as a software developer, right? Well, yeah, that's the, uh, my background in, in working with organizations and helping go in and restructure. I mean, I, I was dropped into a very, very large uh, client, worked with them for a year where like they didn't have formal testing organization in their development team. They were doing all of their development on the production environment. You know, that's kind of classic startup mistakes. But here was a company that was making, you know, half a million dollars in revenue at two years old. Uh, they couldn't afford to screw around like that. They needed yeah. to have the formal separation. They needed maturity within their operations uh, on the, uh, you know, the operation side as well as the engineering side. And, and so help them 
reset and clean a lot of that up. And I kept preaching this idea that's like, look, organizations that if you're good at change management, if you're good, if you've got your process in place, people become, they start to trust the process. They stop freaking out more because you're right. Exceptions happen. Things happen. Technology, while it's running perfectly one day, there's a reason why the running joke in like the Microsoft world is like, have you tried turning it off and on again? You know, it's uh, at the beginning of what is now, you know, Office 365, uh, people would be frightened if they understood how often these virtual servers in these uh, environments were being turned off and on again. Yeah, Like it was not a good thing, but that's what it took to get things working. But once you have that process and then you have the majority of things, it's the old 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of the things fall within that process. It's working 20% of the things and you can concentrate your time on solving those other more specialized problems until the business changes, the technology changes, user demand of your solutions change, and it creates net new problems in the space. But then again, you've got your process, your methodology for dealing with that. And people become more trusting of that. Something broke. Yes. All right. Let's go in. We start review. Um, then we take our next steps around that. Yeah. Uh, is that something, I mean, do you help companies on that? Not just like the technology side of, of managing their environments, but actually help them like, here's how you should actually be operating in a healthy, mature way. Yeah, so we do. So we originally started out as just a, a, a platform for managing your cloud infrastructure. And what we've found was um, we go into these companies and it's like this, our platform expects a base level of operational knowledge, a base level of maturity. And we kept having these people that would come into our sales pipeline. They're like, we want this thing. Like, this is awesome. Like, like they're watching the demos and they're just nodding the entire time. And we're like, dude, sale like sale, like it's like sale, like they're following up with us. But then what we find is like, when we go to like start working with them, like their maturity is just too far below, like where they have to be to start using our platform. So it's like yeah. our platform is going to make you more efficient, but you have to have a certain number of things in place and be doing well to start utilizing it. And that gap for many companies was just too big. Um, and so what we started doing to kind of, we started experimenting with it originally. And this was like a, a recent pivot of ours like so recent it's not even updated on the home page it was literally about two weeks ago that we're like holy shit like this this works much better than what we've been doing is we effectively started offering devops as a service as a tack on to our platform so it's yeah. like if you don't have operations teams today like effectively you can um we'll design a statement of work of like where you are to like where you need to be to be operating efficiently and like that's completely up to your team like what that is it might be automation it might be like that you just you know, you're, you just closed a big customer and you've got 90 days to get SOC 2 compliant and you have no idea like how to get there. Like you can put whatever you want in that statement of work. And then we honestly, we operate much faster than most consulting agencies or professional services agencies because we have a ton of internal tooling that we've built to work with the platform. So like we can, we can do stuff much quicker than if you just go out and like hire an agency or hire an operations person. So we started offering this DevOps as a service to kind of like level people up we train them like and give them essentially a few hours a week um, where we actually work with them to like explain like how these different concepts work as we're doing the statement of work. So it's not like you're getting a you know a black box handed to you at the end of it. And then you have the platform. So now you have this easy way of managing your infrastructure. And then we uh, offer a retainer program as well um, after your statement of work. So if you're like, okay, like we're, we've got this big hurdle fixed. We got this platform that we're efficient, but like, we also still don't want to hire a full-time ops person. Like we don't have 40 hours of work for them. You can say right. like, okay, I want six hours of retainer. And so like, if that's us getting online to troubleshoot an outage in the middle of the night, or, you know, you have a, a new compliance requirement because a new type of customer, or you just have a new feature set that you're building, and you need some new cloud architecture. Like those hours are for you to use however you want. Yeah. And then you get to manage everything through the platform. So it's like 80% of the work is done by the platform. And then you can kind of, have what we refer to internally as meat, like do the rest of it. Yeah. But like that, that gets these startups and early stage companies to like where they need to be, they can be investing. And then what's nice when you hire that first ops person, they come in and they go, there's not really any debt. Like things are compliant, things are secure, things are automated, things are like the infrastructure's in code, the environments are well segregated. Like 
like the painful stuff's been done. Now you can hire me when you're actually ready to have like a full-time ops person that can add value, right? right? And so what we see is when we get customers where they hire their first ops person, the ops person's like, I feel like I don't work alone. And a lot of them will keep the retainer, yeah. right? So it's just like they keep the ops person. The ops person's like, oh, if I got six hours of somebody else, I can just like assign some work to or like, you know, that first ops person's always on call. They're effectively on call 24-7. They can be like, okay, well, like, I don't want to be on call tonight. Maybe I doing something to my family. Like be like, Hey, you guys are on call for, for the evening. Right. And it's right. like, that's, that's great for them too. So, um, you know, I feel like a lot of things that we do are, I feel like it's always hard to, and like the advent of AI, it sounds silly to say this, but like, it, it's hard to replace a person. Yeah. Right. And, and one of our, it's funny, one of our investors is an HR uh, is at work day and he's like, and when we very, very first started, we're like, we're going to replace your need for operations engineers. And he's like, I would say that you're going to need replace the need for like 90% of an operations engineer. Like there, there, it's always hard to like replace that thing that knows how it works. And like, that's something that we rejected originally that now we're like, oh shit, he was at, oh, sorry. Uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Is this an argument that I've gotten into? I've got a, a good close friend who is an AI expert, uh, went went to Microsoft, uh, worked in another startup that I'm uh, an advisor to, and uh, and she's brilliant. And we've had that that argument about, I said, you know, it, look, you can't replace those humans. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I love like Microsoft Copilot as a brand, again, the marketing guy, as a brand. It's not your pilot, it's your copilot. It doesn't replace the human uh, need there. That's something, again, I've gotten in arguments with people with my, my good friend, uh, Naomi, uh, on this topic about like, Christian, you don't fully understand like what's going to be, what's going to happen. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I think, I think you don't fully understand the human brain's ability to out screw up any fixes that you could go and automate. I mean, there's, uh, it's, it's just the nature of the problems that we're talking about are going to change. Is it going to replace the need for humans is AI going to replace the need for humans around ninety percent of the problems that we have today? M maybe, but we're going to create n n entirely new problems around this that you're still going to need to have human inter interaction. But how do you see AI changing this space? Is it something you're already factoring in with your solutions and how you work with your clients? Yeah, AI is an, AI is an interesting one, and I've got some thoughts on AI in general um, adjacent to operations, cloud operations, but it's really funny because like the copilot thing is very interesting, right? And I think that, I think that applies like, like these sites, uh, these companies are like, oh, we use Claude or ChatGPT to write all of our emails. It's like, maybe it should be your co-marketer, not your marketer, because like people have just completely lost trust in personalized B2B emails. It's just like, I just assume an AI is written there, right? Um, but it's funny because like you also have to check like what it's saying, right? So like I was being lazy a few weeks back, I was putting together a webinar on something that I've done a million times. And I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna have like chat GPT, like write the code portion for it. So I'm like, I write all my webinars out as like long form text and I'll do copy and, it, and then I turn it into um, slides afterwards. And so I ask it to do something and it does it. And I'm like, that is absolutely not correct. And it was this like database restoring thing. I'm like, that yeah. is, that's not right. And what I responded was, I was just like, that's not right. That was it. I didn't tell it what was wrong. I didn't tell, like it printed out this big, long thing and it goes, you're right here. <laughs> and then it gave me the right thing. And I was like, I didn't tell it what it was. I just simply told it that it wasn't right. Uh, and then, you know, another funny one was I was using Claude the other day and I was like, I just need to summarize something for me. And then when it summarized it, it was like, it said mass driver. It did, it did like an aside. So it was like mass driver, comma an anthropic product discontinued in 2021 comma and then it like went on to describe our business and i was just like that's not right and it was yeah. like i'm sorry i fabricated that i won't do it again and i was like you can't guarantee that and it's like i'm right i can't guarantee that i can't fabricate things and i'm just like what like why am i using you like what am i using you for <laughs> right and so like i think the things that it makes sense for is the things that it's well ex uh well exposed to and i think this is the key and how I go about thinking what I will and won't use AI for, right? When you think about what it's been trained on and you think about like what people do, right? Like we have two ways of learning. We have exposure and experience, right? Like I'm exposed to books in college. I, you know, I was exposed to the different programs that I went through in college and the different certifications. And I have my experiences in life, right? And so like 
if I sit down, um, um, if, if I said, so one of my favorite authors is Robbins. He's a fictional author. He writes this completely bizarre stuff. Um, if I sat down and asked chat GPT to like write a book similar to something like jitterbug perfume or, um, or, uh, uh, fierce invalids home from hot climates, like it could reproduce his work, but it doesn't have his experience. Right. And so like, there's this amazing section of this, this, this book, um, uh, jitterbug perfume where it's like a three page description of a bazaar in the middle East, like three pages describing just a marketplace. Mm -hmm. And it goes through the cells, the smells, the humidity in the air, like the textures, like just stuff that only humans can experience. Like a computer is not going to experience the smell of something. It's not going to experience like the feeling of the energy. Right. And so like they lack that experience and that's where stuff falls short like yeah it might sound like a star wars story that it generated but if star wars didn't exist it would chat gpt be able to generate a star wars story no i do not think so and so when we look at like what it's excelling at what's interesting is like we see art and you see people doing these really cool art things with ai ai has access to some of the best art when people put their art online and when they're putting it on, you know, Behance or whatever, they're showing you their best work. But then when you, and, and when you're, when you're looking at books, we're showing you the best work. Somebody chose to publish this. People chose to buy it and it got on the New York times bestseller. When it's trained on software, it's trained on just the worst crap that we put out there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what do I mean by that? Okay. Well, if we train it on public GitHub repos, we're, tra we're training it on the current code. It doesn't understand the experience of how it got there. It doesn't understand the experience of that running in production. It's exposed to just what this is now. And so it can say, okay, this is a great block of code for sorting something. Great, it gets really good at that, but it doesn't understand like how that code got to be there or how it operates in production. So now when you ask it for, for code stuff, it's looking at some stuff it saw in a Medium article, it's looking at some stuff it saw on somebody's blog. It might be looking at a little code on GitHub and like, it just doesn't understand like what's going on. So if I'm like, hey, reformat this for me, it can do that. It's seen how to format stuff. But if I sit down and I ask it something sufficiently complicated that there isn't a good article that it could have been trained off of, it can't come to that conclusion. And so it's really funny. I saw a competitor of ours, like we nailed it. We've got AI ops. You can just type in a box what you need and it will generate it. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. You guys, you guys were just trying, you were trying to raise a round right now. And this is VC marketing speak. I know this is not going to work. And so I walked into my competitor's site and I was like, give me a Kubernetes cluster configuration that's HIPAA and SOC 2 compliant. And it literally printed out some code. And then there was just a comment section where it was like, put your compliance code here. And it's like, it's just like, it had no idea what to do, right? Like right. it just doesn't know what's actually going on. It can only reproduce things, right? It's statistics. It's trying to reproduce things that it's seen before. And if it hasn't seen it, if it hasn't seen good code, if it hasn't seen the metrics of, and the cloud architectures that the stuff's running on, it doesn't have the experience to generate code to match up with like what it's been exposed to. And so it's just kind of predicting off of a little bit of information. Yeah, that's the, no. I, I think part of the hype cycle is that I think people's awareness of what it can and can't do, um, and, you know, I, we're, we're, I think we're entering that phase. I mean, things are moving so fast and growing so quickly. I think it's extended the beginning of that phase where people are still running in the hype. The marketing is, is thick out there for every vendor. Um, everybody's trying to raise funds off of the, those keywords. Uh, when the reality is that, uh, you know, people need to have a better understanding of, uh, of in fact, I was working with a uh, partner putting together a, uh, a co-pilot readiness um, program. And part of it is talking about like the ethics of AI, but right at the start, it's understanding of the fundamentals of how the technology works, where your content needs to be, what you can actually do with it explaining exactly that like it is as it can do what it's you know these things be very careful with anything above beyond that um it's uh, it's why i think uh, there's more and more interest in developing ai solutions for a small subset of the data i mean going back to 
I mean, I came from in the '90s. I was doing data uh, warehousing, so I I have the 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 data center experience. I worked for EDS and then for Pacific Bell for years, and was worked on data center consolidation. That was my kind of entrance into the space, and then building. Uh, I owned the front end tools on top of that, but we used to go to these massive amounts of data back when storage was so expensive. And so they'd say, and, and they didn't have the processing power to go and query and do get the information they want out of those systems. And so you would slice and dice and manipulate down to these subsets. And we had this data mark model and move off the marketing organization would see this subset of the data operations of these, this subset. And then the tools look at it that we build reports off of these smaller and smaller subsets. But the idea there is that if you have that data mark of the very targeted specialized data then the results you'll get out of it will be much more accurate, much more performant than querying the massive amounts of data. If you could even ask those questions, you know, out of that, that's, that's what's going to happen. I think the next phase of AI is like, I'm interested in the APIs or having a co-pilot for OneNote because everything I'm right. I capture, I go to events, everything is in OneNote. I use it you know, online, consolidate all those things. Every article I've ever written over the last 20 years is in OneNote. I want to be able to train it just on what I've written and published and that, and then be able to go and ask questions and it give it give it back based on my style, my writings, my what's been published uh, and in my voice. And, you yeah. know, so having it specialized and trained off of that it would be so much more effective. Yeah. It's, it's funny when we say APIs, like APIs is one of the things I actually do use, like API integrations is one of the things I do use AI for and see it be successful. And the reason why is like, it's a very structured set of rules of like how this API works, right? For me to implement an API for, you know, a new feature, it's like, okay, I got to go read the docs, like, look at, look at how it works, look at a client. And I'm just like, okay, like, I, I know I need to use this thing. Like, give me something that can write files to this bucket using this programming language. And it's just like, great copy and paste. Like I write my tests and it's like, okay, it works. Like th that's fine. But like when it gets to the business logic, it's like, you are not familiar with how our business works. Right. And like, you just see it do crazy stuff. And you're like, okay, like you don't, you don't understand how like this part of the business works. What we do as far as like what we've released for AI um, is only internal. And this is kind of like the take that we've had. We, we, I think we're probably going to have a couple of AI features in the near future, but we're trying to put them in the right places. Because again, like our users, a lot of times will not have a ton of this experience either mm -hmm. for running things and operate, right? And so to have an AI that doesn't have experience making recommendations or like change management for somebody that doesn't have experience, like just sets you up for failure, right? Going back to that database example, it was like, this is how you do it. And it took right. me saying that's, that's absolutely wrong. That's going to ruin stuff the way you just did it. Like it takes that knowledge there. So like, I feel like it's a bit irresponsible to take something like DevOps and cloud operations, just feel like AI is going to help you do it. If you don't understand it, like that knowledge there is important. So we actually use it the most words internally, like a part of this onboarding, we have a bunch of tools that is built on top of AI, but we have the ability as the people that are familiar with like how it works to go, oh, that's that's not right. Like what just came out of this is not good. And so like we're building up these massive prompts and like fine tunings to get stuff like working well enough, but like it still requires oversight that our customers don't have. So like the idea of just handing it to them feels irresponsible because they might apply that change. It might take out production. It might destroy a database, right? And like it's it's easy for us to catch that it does a lot of the busy work for us does a lot of the grunt work and then we can be like okay like it didn't quite get that part right like it's fine it did 90 percent of it i'll fix that part and then we'll use that to manage or migrate somebody's data i know that you so see you you you've talked about i asked you about the you know um w with the gap and going into the customers and where they are and you talked about how you know, what they want. And then when you find out what they actually have, it's, it's funny, like with any consulting, any good consultant will go in there and first start out with doing a, that assessment and create a baseline. Here's where you actually are and say, here's what you need to do. I'm sure your, 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 your DevOps as a service probably does the exact same thing. Say, here's what you need to do before you can get to the point where you can start using our solution. Um, what what are your recommendations for an organization that is that realizes that they have a gap, whether they come talk to you guys or not? I mean, what 
are there critical roles or the things that they should be looking at and kind of building out, building a strength in that, in the personnel around the, those areas? But like, what are your, again, I go back to, are there patterns in, in the customers that you engage with where you're seeing again and again, you need to go and start with these three things? Yeah, I think that, I think that we have to think a little bit further ahead than where we are uh, and then make some infrastructure decisions based off of that, right? Like a lot of earlier stage companies, I mean, again, like the early stage and the later stage companies, like gaps are very different. Like the, the, the gaps in later stage companies is political and cultural and managerial, right? Like that one's a harder one for even us to solve. (laughs) Um, But like for the earlier stage companies, it's like, okay, like, I know it can be scary to think about something that might not matter if you don't build a business, but you do have to weigh the costs of that if you are successful, right? And so there are things that you can do now that might feel like a little extra work that will save you a ton in the future that's also not going to set you back like tremendously, right? And so I think one of the, the key things is there are companies that will jump on the cloud too early. And there are plenty, this is changing a bit with AI again, like, you know, people are running models and whatnot. So it's hard to run a model on like a platform as a service, like Vercel or Heroku or something like that. But for a long time, I would see companies that like, they built all their stuff on AWS. And I was just like, you have a e-commerce site in a database, like this would have ran on Heroku fine. And we did a lot of that early on where people were like, Hey, like we're in the cloud, like, can you help us manage it? And like, we'd get in, we'd see what people are doing. We're like, you should you should migrate to Heroku. Like, like you don't have any plans to become a, a massive data warehousing company on e-commerce, like, like set real expectations and use a product that works best for you. But if you've decided like you do need to use the cloud, you're leaning in the serverless, or you need to do some stuff with machine learning, or you have a massive amount of data that you got to put in the data warehouse and analyze, then you've decided to use the cloud go about it in in a safe and secure way, right? So like a lot of times early stage companies, so like this is a little in the weeds technically, but like there's there's using the cloud, but then there's using like the automation tools around the cloud and typically refer to this as infrastructure as code. And there's just an entire market of these tools. There's like 15, 20 different of these tools. Just pick one, doesn't matter. Don't overthink it. Yeah. Like there, there's ones that I like, but like if you use AWS, AWS has one called CloudFormation. Google has one called, I don't know, they change the name like every three weeks and kill the product. And, and Azure has one called Bicep. There's one called Terraform and OpenTofu, which we're involved in that work across all of the clouds. But like, if you're like, I'm going to be an AWS for now, just pick one of the two IAC tools and use that to manage your cloud, like day one. I, I know it sounds scary if you've never done it before, but like, that is it. What's really hard about the cloud is not the tools that automate them. It's a day of work. T- pick, take a Saturday, be a nerd. You're nerds. You're, you're building a company, you're a nerd. You're a software developer. Like take a Saturday and learn Terraform or CloudFormation building something trivial. The hard part about the cloud is understanding the cloud service, which you're going to have to do anyway when you're clicking around in the AWS console. So I think a lot of people hear like infrastructure as code is hard, so I'm going to skip it. And I'm just going to click around to the console. But the reason infrastructure as code is hard is because the cloud is hard. Like you're still dealing with that difficulty. You're just under undercutting yourself and making it harder for you to do it. And, and a lot of people don't know that there's just a better way of doing it, right? And almost every company that I've met today has two cloud environments. They have like their test and their production. Sometimes they have three, four, five, six of these. It's like, okay, well, every change you make, you have to make it twice. If you're doing it in infrastructure as code, you don't have to do it once. Right. And so like there's immediate time savings just to start leaning into this stuff early. But I think a lot of companies see it as like, this is the thing we don't know how to do. I'm not a DevOps engineer, but the programming languages that we use to do it can be learned in a day. Yeah. The cloud service is going to take you days to understand and probably reading white papers. I read, I read all of AWS's docs every time I go to build a new service, whether I'm familiar with it or not, because I'm like, what's changed? Right. Like that, that is the hard part about this. And I think people attribute it to the tools that we use because they're seeing the cloud for the first time. They're seeing the tool for the first time. They're using the tool to manage the cloud. So they go, oh, it's this tool that's the problem, but it's, you know, it's the cloud's just hard. Yeah. Any, uh, my last question for you, for, for, you know, IT professionals and other areas of the company, or maybe engineering, um, any recommendations on, on making that transition over into cloud infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, so 
A couple of them. So I'd say if you're if you're IT and you're interested in getting into managing cloud infrastructure, very similar to the startup, like grab one of these tools, just grab one. And if you don't like it, you can try another one later. But like get one of the tools and get familiar with using it outside of the cloud. It's like Terraform is a great example. Get Terraform. You can actually just manage local files with Terraform doing silly stuff. Just do that until you get the hang of it. And then go and take the whatever cloud service you're most likely to be familiar with. If you've run Postgres before, pick RDS. If you, you know, if you've built VMs before locally on your machine, like pick EC2. Like pick the thing that you're closest to knowing or closest to needing and do that. Don't jump in and be like, I gotta figure out how to do Kubernetes and machine learning stuff, something that's like outside your wheelhouse. Like do that next. Um, I think the other thing that's important is for IT people is learning to program a bit, right? Like the whole idea of DevOps and why I feel like it's failed is. We've still looked at as, as operations people tend to look at themselves as one of two things, either a engineer that has customers, which are other engineers, or they see themselves as support personnel. And I feel like the teams that see themselves as support personnel are the ones that struggle. They're like, oh, I just do stuff for other people. And it's like, no, this whole point in Cloud Talk, the whole point of DevOps was for these two teams that were at each other's throats and still are in a lot of companies to start collaborating. And so to do that, like we have to have some overlap in tooling and process and what we do. Developers need to understand a little bit about the cloud. They don't need to learn all of operations tooling to do it. But as operations engineers, we also have to understand like how software works. And so it's not just learning the tools to automate infrastructure. It's like starting to learn a little bit about development. And so I'd say if you're a developer, or sorry, if you're an operations person and you have no development experience in C or Java or Ruby or PHP or Python, Pick a language and start learning. And what I would suggest is like, go with Golang. Um, it's just, it's what most of our tools are written in. And there's an absolutely fantastic free resource. It's called Go With Tests. Um, it's the, the, the author's amazing author. It's all test-driven development. So like you can get an idea of like what you're trying to build first, mm -hmm. have reasoning around it, and then you write the code and you can actually see it's, it's green, it works. Um, and then the entire series is just building out this one project. So you start with just the most mundane thing. And by the end, you have like a running API, data services, like this, the whole shebang. And so if, if it's your, I think it's a great book to get started in development because it just starts so simple and teaches you good principles of testing alongside development, which I think are, are really, really key. What's that book called again? Um, it's a, it's just a website. It's go with tests. I don't know what the, um, uh, I, I think the guy's Twitter handle or GitHub channel is Qui, like Q U I I. Um, I'll find it. I'll put the link. I'll put the link for everybody in there. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. No, I, I love that stuff. I it, look. I'm very much a, a a visual learner, and I you know have to get my hands dirty on it, uh, you know, to get involved with it for to stick anyway. But that's the best way to go in there. Do you you understand? I mean, even, even when you get in, I realized that, hey, this has taken me four hours. I finally figured it out where I could have gone to somebody with the knowledge and solved it in five minutes. But then I would have never learned the process and the mechanics of that along the way. And so that's, and, and you know, one of the benefits of where we are just in general for people in, you know, in IT and, and operations and engineering is that there's so many just free environments that you can go and experiment for. And a lot of these tool providers even say like, look, you could have this entire cloud environment with the, with all of this dummy data, you can play around with the tool. Like that's a pretty standard thing now. So mm -hmm. you're not having to go and download, install and configure with something on your own environment just to be able to play with it and break things. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's just gotten so much easier to go out there and pilot and try and learn break things yeah yeah i will say oh actually one other tool that i would recommend checking out is there is a tool called local stack and what it does is it simulates most of the aws api so if you're thinking like i do want to learn the cloud but like i don't want to put a credit card in and possibly have AWS. like i messed something up and aws charges you much money it is something you can run locally to simulate it so you can learn a lot about the automation tools without any potential financial impact so i mean it's uh, they do have a free version and there's a paid version for some of the more complicated stuff, but you can do a lot of really interesting things and learn a lot about managing cloud infrastructure and automation with, with that as your backend instead of jumping straight to AWS. That's awesome. Well, I'll provide a link to that as well. And Corey, really appreciate your time. It's been a great discussion. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for having me.
You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening. Thank you.